Hello, there's a blacksmithing series on YouTube called Man at Arms Reforged and they take movie saws and, and things from anime and video games, all kinds of stuff like that and make them for real. They'll have something like He-Man's Sword, I don't know if that's an actual episode, it should be, <laughs> and then they'll go Sword of Greyskull Reforged and it's, a, it's all very exciting with lots of dramatic music and epic shots of, of thing, weapons being forged and then heated and tempered and so forth and then a dramatic finish where they chop something up. It's great. This is not that. This is a far more humble story. This is a reforging but of a teeny weeny camping axe. Now, I've never made an axe before but I'm going to try recreating this axe head here and then I shall fit it to the original handle. That's the plan. Like I say, never done this before, but I have done a couple of hammers, so similar but different. <laughs> I'm sure it's obvious by now, but I'm going to spell out the point anyway, that this is not going to be a tutorial video. If you do want a tutorial video on axe making, or indeed any blacksmithing, I highly recommend checking out um, Black Bear Forge. He's done some great tutorial videos and I'll be referring to those myself when it comes to forging this. This video is just going to be me having a go at something. <laughs> As per usual. This is actually not my axe. This is um, belonging to a chap called Tom and he's a patron of mine. Actually he got in touch long before he was a patron and said would I be interested in remaking this axe for him and I agreed. Um, and I don't really take on commissions, but this was way back when, and I did look it up. And it's something sometime in 2019, the beginning of 2019, I think. So, yes, it's been an embarrassingly long time getting to the top of the pile, but here we are, Tom. <laughs> I'm actually getting on with it. So this is what I've got to work with. The handle seems fine. I think this is reusable. It's got the original wedges, wooden wedges, in there and in there, which I can extract and make new ones. So I think that'll be alright. The head though, you can see, is, is no use as it is. So I've, I have got all the bits, but they've, so they've fractured and fallen out. So an obvious question would be, why go to a bother of reforging an axe head, making a new one? Why not just weld these bits back on and call it done? I could do that, and on an axe this small, it's, you could possibly get away with it because there's not much force going through the head. But it's just not something, <laughs> it just doesn't feel right to repair it like that. It would never be very strong. Um, this is actually tool steel, obviously, because it's, it's not mild steel. You need uh, hardenable steel to make tools. That makes it awkward to weld. It's doable. Anything's repairable, but yes, it's not the best way to go about it. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to make a new one. I can't be sure what caused this damage, but I do have my suspicions. I think that it was drifted. When this eye was drifted out, it was possibly part of that operation was done at too low a temperature. And you can see this part here is bigger than this part. So the drift would have come in like that and been hammered in there in whatever, whether it was a by machine or person, probably by machine I guess, but it's gone in there to open up that hole and I think the metal was too cold at that point and it's put some stress in here and then that stress has then been a weak point forever after so when this was heat treated and then put into use it's always had a, a weak point and you might be able to see just there, it does look different, right in the middle of that bit of metal, just there. So with repeated use, probably over many years, that fracture has then opened up and at some point it's just given up completely. That's just my guess, but it, it seems reasonable, because it has come away that way. So there's two ways of making an axe, well two main ways anyway. The first is to have a, a folded axe. So you'd get the, a piece of um, steel or it could be iron 
that would be twice as long as that and then you wrap it around you weld the two bits together, forge weld the two bits together and then if you've made it out of iron or mild steel you then put in a higher carbon steel on the cutting edge and weld that in as well and that's your axe. The other method is to take a solid piece of steel so in this case the actual steel itself, the entire piece of steel would be one lump of high carbon steel. You then punch a hole through it and then you drift out the hole. So you make the hole bigger until it's big enough to accept the handle. And that's the method I'm going to use. And the material is going to be another piece of road spring. So it's the, the same spring that I used to make a batch of cleavers um, a while ago now. It's really hard stuff. Um, well, it's not really hard stuff actually, it's really tough stuff. <laughs> So spring steel, well let's go outside and I'll show you. As regular viewers will know, a few years ago I bought a 7.5 tonne lorry mainly for the engine to go into Project Awesome. It also provided lots of other goodies including these leaf springs. This one and this one are the, or used to be the rear springs and then these two were the front springs. So this is likely to be what's called 5160. That's the usual grade of steel that you use for road springs and such. So the 51 refers to the fact it's got some chromium in it and the 60 is 0.6 of 1% of carbon. In other words the hardness or the amount of hardenability of it. To put that in context that's quite low. So uh, the knives that I make would be somewhere up in the 80. Um, you, a small knife you could get if you wanted it to be very sharp 90-ish something like that. Um, and then down to 60 like this means it's going to be it's going to have a bit more give to it. You're not going to get the ultimate edge um, although I have got my cleavers up to shaving sharp which is pretty sharp. Point is, the point I'm trying to get to is a more durable, it's a tougher steel. It's a very, very tough steel. It's, <laughs> as we're going to find out when I try and forge it, it's really tough, even when it's glowing hot. Right, let's get this over. Um, obviously I'm not going to need all of this. So I'm going to weigh the axe head that I've got in there and see how much of this I need to cut off. Let's see what we're aiming at then. Three hundred and fifty. Twelve and a smidge ounces. You've got to allow for losses during forging and grinding and such. I'm going to aim for 400 grams starting weight, which will be slightly over a pound. <laughs> so that's nearly twice what we need. Well, that was badly estimated, wasn't it? Six one six. That'll do us. So, like I said, the way I'm going to make the axe is by punching a hole through the steel and then drifting it out to size. I'm going to have to make both the tools to do those processes. Um, for the, making the initial hole I need to make a slot punch which I reckon I can do by modifying uh, one of my chisels so we're going to have a look at those in a bit and then I'm going to need a drift that's the sort of shape of, of that. This is the drift I made for um, making a hammer head and you can see how it goes in like that. And so for a hammerhead, you drift it from both sides, you have a, like a slightly tapering drift, as this one is, and you're going from one side and then the other. So inside there is a very slight hourglass shape, and the reason for that is when you put the handle in, you can put the handle in from one side, put the wedges in from the top, and it expands to fill that gap snugly. 
So before I, before I actually get stuck into making the axe, I'm going to have to make those two tools. So a slot punch is very similar to a chisel and in fact I could use a chisel to go through um, and make the initial hole. But I think a chisel would possibly wander off. It's um, yeah, a punch would be better. And I've got round punches like that, and that's what I use to do the um, rose arch. This this one. And then I've got chisels like this. This is the one I use to cut the slots for the. Um, the chisel twist pokers. So along those lines. Yeah, I think this one I'll do. So this is an old chisel that's a bit beaten up anyway. You see, <laughs> that's yeah. It's gone a bit wrong anyway. Uh, yeah, I think this would do. Yeah, so I'll heat that up and just modify that end a bit. It just needs the, I mean it's blunt anyway, so it just needs blunting off a bit more and then the edges knocking off to make it round and that will do us. Well, that's relatively easy. So a slot punch is quite easy to find then, or materials, something to make a slot punch from. Um, so I need to make a drift. Now this is under the band so it's my collection of offcuts of useful bits and bobs. In this section here I've got a load of uh, little collection of bits here. They are literally bits um, from a pneumatic hammer for kangaroo up the road. So I think that's what I have. No idea where they came from. Bigger ones there, that's the that's actually quite a useful tool in its own right. I think it will just about do. Although, actually thinking about it, if I had a longer drift I could hang on to it yes, without the need of tongs. That's going to be a bit stubby. Alright, change of plan. I'm going to use this slightly longer one because I think during some of the operations it's going to help if I can jam the drift in and actually use it as a handle for forming the axle. forging this one. I'll just take it to the sander once it's cooled down and tidy it up a bit but pretty much there. The drift I'm going to have to upset it so when it comes out this end will be hot and I'll pound it on the anvil there and try and squidge it up this way and fatten it out that way a bit. start to form it into the sort of teardrop shape it's going to have to be.
needs to fatten a bit, so I'm going to have to heat this section here and squidge it this way a bit to fatten out this bit here. now and finish it off with a sander. I'll just leave that to cool now. It'll take hours and hours to cool down and in the process that will anneal it, it will soften it and uh, relax the structure of the, of the metal. As for these two, I think we're there, with, well I've done as much as I can forging wise. I'm going to just go over them with the angle grinder with a, a really cool sanding disc in to tidy them up a bit. I'm, even though these are both tool steel I'm not going to heat treat them. I don't see any real point to it. I mean, obviously heat treating them would make them much harder but as soon as you put the drift into something that's <laughs> as hot as it's going to be, um, that heat treatment would be lost anyway, so I'm just going to go with them as they are. Okay, that's as much as I can do tonight. I'll see you back here tomorrow. Let's see where we got to. So there's the lump of spring steel. That orange that you can see, that's just the old paint that's still on there. I should have um, wide brushed it really when it was hot. It doesn't really matter because it's all going to get burnt off as soon as it goes for a few more forge cycles. So we'll heat that up in a bit. And then the drift and the slot punch I need to tidy up a bit. So that's as it, as it was forged and it's it's not far off but the thing is with both of these tools um, they're going to be forced through some really tough steel so it all needs to be nice and smooth basically you want as least resistance as possible as it goes through See that's really nothing special, but now the edges are much smoother, so it has to do its job. And this might be quite a funny looking shape, but I think that's about right. Obviously I've never made one of these before because I've never had need to use one. Having made some tools then and prepped to the material, it's finally time to start actually working on the axe.
less than the thickness I'm going to be hammering. That should be about right. about as hot as I could get it in that gas forge so with that metal it's going up to a nice healthy bright orange which would normally be fine but well as you could probably see under the power hammer you know even under the power hammer it wasn't moving very much I'm just thinking about what that's going to be like next up when I have to punch this right through it what I'm saying is I might need a bit more heat um, now the coal forge I have will give a bit more heat, but it's out of commission at the moment, so I may have to yeah, but I may have to bite the bullet to sort that out before I can continue. <clears throat> anyway, I'll have a think about that. <laughs> See you tomorrow. took the solid fuel forge away um, God, probably maybe a year ago since I last used it I took it away so I could raise the level of the ground outside um, so I had to come back anyway it's always the plan to put it back but this is just move that forward a bit before I light the forge there I'm going to just put some marks on here so I know where to start right in here somewhere So when I punch through, I'm going to go from both sides and then meet in the middle. That's the plan. So I'm going to put a mark on here, half an inch in. And half an inch in here from here. Or 12 mil if you're going to be metric about it. So all I've done is put a punch mark there, the centre punch, and then that'll be the edge of the slot punch. That's how I know where to start. Off we 
Okay. Did you get spoiled a bit with the uh, gas forge in there? Which can't be beat for convenience, but it's, this is much more versatile. And uh, it's perfectly possible to get gas forges that go up much hotter than the one that I'm running there, but um, it's fine for <laughs> nearly everything that I do. Just occasionally you need a bit more of so this is where we're going. This stuff is just um, economy household coal. Generally on a solid fuel forge you're burning uh, coke, which is the coal equivalent of charcoal. Personally I always burned charcoal, actual charcoal, until very recently when I stopped making it. But it, it's something I will get back into, but uh, I keep saying that. Too many projects. So I found coke to be quite tricky to use on this. Um, coke burns very hot, very clean, but you have to have a constant air supply. You turn off the air and it tends to go out, which makes it a bit uneconomical if you're just working on one thing, like, like we are here. did try anthracite but it was pretty much the same. What I like about coal is the volatiles which is normally the problem with coal. And it's just a bit more forgiving I think. Charcoal, if you use charcoal on the forge it's, it's brilliant. You just get a really clean very hot heat on there and when you turn off the, off the air it just goes down into a simmer you can almost let it go out and then turn the air down and boom, straight back on again. It's so controllable, it's lovely. But if you have to buy charcoal to put on a forge, it could quite be expensive. This is the air machine, it's uh, for a bouncy castle. <laughs> Cost me ten pounds. And it's brilliant, it does the job perfectly. more air than I need. So I tend to choke the intake a little bit. Right, put that on. All these big flames around the outside, that's all the volatiles burning off. But in the middle there, I see you've got some proper hot coals. And there's our piece. It's still coming up to heat, but I'm going to make the first few goes with the punch uh, now while it's at orange heat, just so I can see the, that punch mark a bit better. Once it's up to temperature like this, it's a case of managing it. So I'm going to pull the coals in slowly from the outside and they'll burn off the volatiles and when they're coats I can drop them in. Wow, disaster. <laughs> uh. so, while I was bringing the camera in to set it up again, I left the metal in there too long and it's burnt. So I pulled it out of the fire and it was sparking. That bit there, you can see it's bubbled up. That metal's now useless. Oh dear. That's embarrassing. 
but if there is an upside, at least it happened now, and not when I'm halfway through, so I haven't really wasted much effort. So you might be able to see that corner this looks like a moon crater. So that metal's gone now, that's useless. Fortunately, it's because I've still got way too much material in this axe head. I can start again on the other side. I'm just going to do is clean this up. Yuck. What a schoolboy error. <laughs> Oh dear. Right, if I mark that there. So I just start on the other end. The other end's fine. It's just that one corner. soon get back up to heat. So there it is, that's the little plug. See on the, just poked out, that's the, uh, the only bit of wastage by doing it this way. So that's not the chisel poking through, that's the, that's the finicky axe head. That's it then. It's through. That went all right, I think. Um, it was hard work, but we got there. So that I think is probably the hardest part of the job: is punching an eye right through it, and that's that's actually quite a long way. What I'm going to do now is put it back in the in the forge. I'm going to bring it back up to temperature, um, a bright orange. And then I'll just turn the forge off and let it cool down in the coals. Um, and that will help normalise it and get some of the stresses out from what I've just subjected it to. Now this hole's not perfect. <laughs> well, it, was, it wasn't going to be, was it? So it's, there's a slightly more material on this side than that side. Um, but that's, that's okay, I can work with that. There's still way more material than I need. Um, which turned out to be a good thing because of that embarrassing incident with uh, overheating it. So that corner there will be ground off. Well, 
we'll come to all this once it's uh, normalised. So yes, that'll do for now. <laughs> so yes, bring it up to heat, normalise it. Um, that'll do us for today. <sighs> I'll see you back here for the next bit. Let's see what we got then. So it's actually been quite a few days since I last worked on this. Just suddenly had tons of uh, wind and rain and all sorts of carry on. As a result of all the effort so far, doesn't look like much, does it? You might be wondering why I didn't do all that uh, punching work under the power hammer. Well, there's two reasons. First is is control. Even though I, I can control the power of the hammer really quite well by how hard I push down on this treadle, which determines how hard the motor engages with that tyre, and thus the actual power coming through. So that's quite controllable, but the aim, mm, that's a bit, a bit trickier because you've got so many things going on here already. But the main reason is that the stroke isn't very long on this. So what I'm trying to say there is that if I adjust this one here, so I can adjust this link here, which opens up this gap, so I can get that under there, that's not a problem. Obviously I wouldn't be able to use this slot punch. I'd have to make up something like this. So a much shorter punch. But by the time I've got that in there and got room for this, there's not going to be much room for the hammer to actually do its stuff. So it's not going to have much of a swing. It's a bit like if I was using a hand hammer and only doing that. <laughs> there's not going to be much going on. Yeah, there's probably ways around that, and if I was doing more than one axe, then yes, I'd have a good think about using this, but we got there anyway. Anyway, back to what we're looking at. That there, that's the bit that got burnt. So I didn't manage to catch it in camera, it was quite dramatic, there was a shower of sparks came off it. That is useless, that corner, but fortunately that was confined to just that corner. Um, so I'm going to cut that off. Obviously I'll cut, the, cut out this bit where I started that hole. On that side I'll just grind it a bit. Let's see how much it weighs now. Oh, we're at 5.43. So it's still 200 grams over what it needs to be. So there's plenty I can cut off yet. So that's, that's good. I'm glad I left it so overweight now. So I've cut off the two sections that we don't want, so that bit there where the, hole, the first hole was started and the burnt corner is gone. I'll switch to a grinding disc and tidy that up a bit. I mean, if I carried on grinding long enough, I could, I could grind it into the shape of an axe. But that would be tedious. Both for me and for you. <laughs> it does look a right, <laughs> right mess at the moment. But I'm not unhappy with that. I think that's the hard work done. So, yes. But we shall see. What I'm going to do is to heat it up again now and then reshape it to replace the missing bits that I've just chopped off. Um, so I'm going to get some of the shape back into it again and then we'll take it from there. I think that's the way to go. So yeah, so this will have to be pushed up to replace that. Obviously I've got to open up the hole a lot more yet. Do that with the drift. So yeah, all right, slight of forge.
lift is through all the way both sides now and that hole is as big as it needs to be but it needs to be <laughs> tidied up, centralised, all sorts. Possible things that could go wrong with a power hammer. I, I, I'd have put. <laughs> I wouldn't have expected this to break. So this is the actual spring. Has, has, just given up. Check that out. So it's, that's just metal fatigue, and uh, it is no more. So obviously a broken spring does put the power hammer out of action. Yeah. Fortunately we've got the bulk of work done. What I'll do now then is heat this back up in the forge and then use the the ball of the ball pin hammer on there to try and bring it out that way somewhat. That was what I was trying to do on the power hammer when it gave up. So yes, we'll do that a bit. So I want to get a bit more flare to this before I cut off the final excess bit of metal and then we'll know what we've got to work with to finish it off. That's good progress, I think. So that, I think, is looking much more axe-like than it did a little while ago when we started. So that's what we're aiming at. So this is the top of this one. And I think I've got enough, yeah. So there's enough span in the actual bit of it. It's gonna have a different, a different eye to it. So this eye here just tapers in one direction. And I've, the only reason I can think of for doing that, if you don't have a detachable handle, is to um, is just for ease of making it. It's, it doesn't make it a better axe. I, I can't see it being the case anyway. But it does mean that you can just do that in one operation, just punch down in one direction. Which, like I say, is probably, or possibly at least, but probably, I reckon, in my opinion, my <laughs> quite possibly is what caused this stress fracture. Anyway, that's as far as I'm going to go today. Yes, I'm going to stop there while I'm ahead <laughs> and carry on again tomorrow.
So I need to do I need to do a little bit more forging. See when I left it, it's not quite straight. It comes this way a bit, so I have to sort that out. Um, there's still some hammer marks that need to be tidied up. But overall it's <laughs> it's pretty close. Three fifty on the original. I was gonna get a little bit heavier on this. Yeah, it's four three six. Still a fair bit to trim down, but I think once that's once I tidy up the edges here, we're not gonna be far off. But because I'm not actually going to brutally forge it today, I'm going to just fire up the gas forge and it'll be hot enough in there for, for this shaping. Well, it's this tidying up, not really shaping. Yeah. So the shape is pretty much there. Um, I've got to take some off the edge here. I've taken out most of the hammer marks, so it's kind of an acceptable finish now. I've also tidied up the pole of the hammer, this back bit here. The only bit I'm unhappy with is the taper here is different to the taper on the, the other side here. I'm going to slim this bit down a little bit. That's it then. I'm going to try using these spring fullers to even it up a bit where it comes down on that taper. hammer would have been really handy for finishing it off because it's a fairly parallel set of
that's as good as I'm going to get it by forging. So I've got the shape, top and bottom, just the way I, I want it. Um, this is going to look slightly different because, yeah, <laughs> I'm going to grind it with a slight upsweep there and obviously the curve for the edge. So it won't look quite like that, but the taper is just right. I'm happy with the pole, I'm happy with the eye. So it's all good. Once again then I'm going to bring it up to a nice orange temperature and I'll shut the forge off and just let it cool down in the forge and that will normalise it. All this normalising is probably a bit over the top but bear in mind it was a truck spring so the more I can do to release its memory of being a truck spring the better. Just about hand it. So let's compare it to the original. Look. So this one is fractionally smaller here on the pole, but I'll let myself off for that. The other dimensions are pretty good. I'm going to try and Try and get the shape of this one on here then. So yeah, so we'll have something like that. Yeah, Tantalizingly close, but I'm not that happy with this side of it. I've had to make too much of a bevel there. There's a slightly lumpy bit just there. Just there. <laughs> mm. I could grind it out. So I could grind it out and it would all be fine, <laughs> but I thought, having forged so much of the shape with a hammer, it would be nice just to finish it off and to only have the, um, the, the actual bevel as the uh, sanded bit, as the shiny bit. So yeah, so I'm going to have to heat it up again and just... Just tidy that end bit there. <laughs> it's going to bug me otherwise, I know it. bottom very, very slightly but that's pretty much there now I bet that looks exactly the same <laughs> but I can see a difference I just thought something I'm 
haven't put them on it yet. <laughs> We're there. Well, <laughs> no, we're not. But, but there for the um, yeah, this part of the procedure. Pretty close, I think. The only thing I'm going to do before I heat treat it is just run a file down the inside there, um, a round file, just to tidy up, just a little bit inside the eye, just. Nothing really. I'll do it now before it's hardened. It'll be a little easier. To the heat treat. The so heat treat involves bringing it back up to bright orange, so non magnetic, critical temperature, however you want to call it. Um, get it saturated with that heat all the way through, bring it out of there, stick it into some warm oil. So we use this tub of olive oil, and the first thing I'll do is heat it up a bit. So I'll heat up this bit of angle and stick it in there. Now I want the oil to be round about as hot as you could bear to put your hand in. might have seen there I got it hotter on this part than I did there um, because obviously this is what I want to be hardened <laughs> back here it doesn't really matter sound there 
that's what we're after. So that noise, we get a bit of mild steel. So this is mild steel. You should be able to hear the, the difference. It's quite apparent to me, I'm not sure how well that comes across, but that it's much more noise. This is a much duller noise. And that's basically because the, the file is tearing into this mild steel. Where it's, it's doing something to this, as you'd expect, but not much. So that's good. So I'll let that cool down and then I'm going to put it in the kitchen oven and temper it. I'm going to put it in a gas mark 8 um, and I'll do two cycles of an hour. I'll probably only need to do one cycle in fairness, but no harm in doing two. Okay, two hours later and here we go. So it <laughs> doesn't look much different, but I'm going to try and show you. If I can catch the light just right. There is um where I went over it with the file there and made it shiny. You should be able to see a slight tinge of brown. That's the oxide layer forming. Um I'm oh, it's still quite hot. Sticking water now. The reason I'm showing you that oxide layer is that that's an indication of the temperature that the that the piece reached in the oven. So that's one way of telling if you've got up to tempering temperature. As it gets hotter, the oxide colours change um, until you get to black heat, and then, <laughs> and then the whole thing starts glowing. You've gone too far, which you're not going to get in a kitchen oven. But anyway. So sticking in water now is fine because I'm not quenching it. It's only cooling down from a tempering temperature, which is hardly anything at all <laughs> compared to what it's been through. Right, let's get this cleaned up um, and then just think about putting a handle on it. While I'm doing this, I'm working on a bit of slack. So this, when that goes down, you see the roller comes up, there's a little gap here between this platen and the roller. And there's a tiny bit of flex to the belt there, so that's where I push in. And the reason I'm doing that is because I want a, a um, convex edge to it, so it's coming in like that. do I think. That's up to 320. Nearly there then. All that's left is the handle. So I'm going to try and put the original handle on the new head. So the old handle here, I don't know if this is going to focus, you can see it's got a couple of wooden wedges in there. I think yeah and a bit of glue. Glue's annoying. So I'll, I'll saw those out first. Okay. Let's go over the woodworking corner. Because they're glued in there, they're not going to want to come out. So. So 
So remember I did make the the eye of this is somewhat different to this, that's where they do differ. Because this one came, I came in from both sides. Um, whereas this one is much bigger at the bottom than the top. Yeah, so we're not far off there. Um, It's on. That's rather tightly on. I'm going to wedge it anyway, um, so I'm going to have to cut that excess off there. That's sat on there quite nicely now. And I've managed to get it sat on snugly on there without splitting the wood, so... <laughs> That's good. need some wooden wedges to flare that top bit out just a tad. Wooden oak might do. What I'm trying to do it, it's too small to cut it with a saw. So I'm not going to use a power saw. saying I wouldn't use a power saw. Probably can't even see that thing on camera but it's just it's a little scroll saw over there and that managed to saw a wedge shape. So. There we go then so one going across and then two splaying it that way. That is done. That feels like a very nice little axe, actually. Very choppy. <laughs> very nice in the hand. Mm. Don't really want to give it away now. <laughs> oh, I have to make myself one. We'll finish off then with a bit of uh, linseed oil. Doesn't have to be linseed oil. Um, it's just what I use on the on the knives. Beeswax would do. But the linseed oil is good for the handles as well, and then it's going to dry. This is um, boiled linseed oil, so this will dry fairly promptly. Of course I can't finish the video without testing it out. So I'll wait till morning and go and find some kindling and uh, we'll see what we can do. <laughs> How right on cue. Just before we head off and test this thing, anybody want to guess how long it took me to make it? <laughs> I've just put all the footage so far onto the computer ready for editing and at the moment so before the testing bit so just the making of it it's 10 hours and 13 seconds um, although that does include making the
That does include making these, of course. So there was a, a couple of hours in there at least. So just for the accent, we could say maybe seven hours or a bit longer. But uh, <laughs> it's a good job for Tom's sake that I don't charge by the hour anymore. Bear in mind though, this is partly that's so long, well, a little bit of it, it's because of filming, obviously, so there's quite a bit of talking on, on the way there, which delays things a, a tad. Um, mainly though, it's because it's effectively prototyping now. I've never made an axe before, so <laughs> I'm feeling my way in the dark for a lot of it. But yes, it didn't feel like it went badly at all. Um, nothing went really wrong. I mean, the power hammer broke, but that's just... That's quite easy. That's an easy fix. I'm not. I'm not even upset about that. Nothing went wrong with this, um, well, apart from burning it slightly. But even that, I got away with it. There was enough material in there to chop it off. So yes, all in all, I was very happy with the build. Yes, it went well, despite taking a long, long time. Right, let's go and test this thing. So we've ventured outside for a bit of on-location filming. This is some hawthorn that I'm chopping up for firewood. Probably not the sort of stuff you'd normally use a camping axe for. Very tough word, Hawthorn. Let's, let's see what happens. Right, here's a very old branch. Let's see what it does actually cutting. I must say I'm quite impressed with its cutting ability. I knew it'd be good at splitting you know, small stuff like this because that's the geometry of the head goes for that, but yes, I'm pleasantly surprised and <laughs> pleased how well it cuts through things. That's still properly sharp. That's gratifying. <laughs> well, there we go then. That's my first attempt to making an axe and I think I got away with it. Tom's Tiny Axe, reforged. Thanks for watching.